Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here to help you improve your chess game. This is a video that's more like a podcast, so if you're looking for a lot of board action, I've got a few hundred other videos that you might enjoy. Uh, also, this is for people that have been playing online, and now they're starting to think, okay, you know, once COVID starts getting better, I'd like to start playing in over-the-board tournaments, which is really the only way, at least currently, that you can get serious titles like expert or master or get an international title. You have to play over the board. So people go to their first tournament and they, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to prepare. They don't know what to expect. So this is for you. This is to tell you a little bit about your tournament. And now if you've been to one or two tournaments, this could actually be helpful too, but not as much. So I'm going to base a lot of what I'm saying on a novice nook that I wrote many years ago called Enhancing Your First Tournament Experience. And I'm going to talk about that with some notes. First thing I'd like to tell everybody is when you're getting ready for a tournament, the number one thing you can do is get a lot of rest. It's sort of like taking a final exam. They did a study once and people who crammed half the night and then took the exam in the morning did less good than people who just studied in the evening and then got a full night's sleep, even though the people who crammed half the night studied twice as much. So is it better to study eight hours for the final exam and then get four hours sleep, or is it better to study for four hours and then get eight hours sleep? And the answer was, it's better to study for four hours and get eight hours sleep. Well, it's the same thing for going to a chess tournament. You wanna have plenty of rest for the tournament. You don't wanna to go to the tournament tired that would really make things a lot less fun. Second thing I tell people is that uh, when you're going to a tournament, um, you don't wanna play a lot of slow chess right before the tournament because you wanna, that will burn yourself out. And when you're halfway through the tournament, you're gonna start thinking, oh my goodness, I played so much chess that uh, you know I, I don't wanna play anymore. So you want to be fresh for every move. On every move, you want to be able to try your best. You want to be excited about playing. You want to, you know, be at your very best when you're playing. And if you play too much chess before that, you can kind of burn yourself out. So I tell people, yes, you can play chess before the tournament. In fact, it's a really good idea. One of the things I tell people is find out what the time control of, is of the tournament. Let's say they're playing 80-minute uh, games with a 10-second increment. Well, then in the couple of weeks leading up to that, you might want to play one or two games at that time limit, 80 minutes with a 10 second increment. So you get used to the time limit so that when you're playing there, you know how to pace yourself. It, you don't want to go into a tournament where it's a time limit that you're not used to. And it takes you half the tournament to figure out how to play fast enough or slow enough that you're playing at the right speed. You want to play exactly at the right speed right from the first move of the first game. And if you're not an experienced player and you don't know how to adjust for different time controls and you go into a tournament and you're used to playing, let's say you're online and you're used to playing 45-45 and now you're playing 80-10, well, that's a different kind of pacing and you have to get used to it. So I would say play a game or two with a friend or an acquaintance before the uh, tournament to get used to that. Okay, uh, let's go down the list here a little bit. Um, well, know the rules of the tournament. Each tournament has different rules. Uh, they're usually posted uh, online. You want to figure out, you know, what you know, which rounds you can take a buy in. If you you don't have to play all the rounds of a tournament, it's also it's important to tell you if you go to a tournament, it's not elimination. If you lose a game, you don't go home. Almost every single tournament is some form of Swiss tournament where you're playing someone who's doing as well as you are or it might be a Saturday quad. A quad is a, th a four person round robin where you play the other three players. If it is a Swiss tournament and it's six rounds and you don't wanna play on Saturday night, you don't have to. You can tell the tournament director that you wanna buy, but you usually have to tell them by a certain point. You can't just wait and call them on the phone five minutes before it starts and say, give me a buy. You have to tell him either before the event or before the start of the second round or something like that that you won't be there on Saturday night and you want to buy. By the way, if you're, if you're a low rated player and you're playing in a higher section and you want and you, you're the odd person and the tournament director gives you a buy, you don't have to take a full point buy if you don't want to play the stronger players in your section. 
you can ask them to take a half point buy or a zero point buy. A lot of people don't know that. And they, you know, they're rated uh, 950 and they play in the under 1400 section and they're the lowest rated player and they get a buy in the first round. And what they really want to do is play the people rated 1000 and 1100. And by getting a full point buy, they end up playing the 1300s and that's not who they want to play. So you can tell the tournament director if he offers you a buy that you'd like something less than a full point buy. If you don't say that, they'll give you a, the full point buy. If you're trying for a prize, of course, that's what you do. Now, this brings up another issue, which is figuring out what section you want to play in. These days, a lot of the overboard tournaments have multiple sections. If there's a lot of sections and the lowest section, let's say the lowest section is under a thousand and you're an adult and you've been playing online, but you're an unrated player and you can play in the under a thousand section, you might not want to do that because maybe that's where there's a bunch of little kids playing and they play really fast. And if you're one of those adults who doesn't like to play little kids who play really fast, it might be upsetting in your first tournament. Hopefully not. But you might want to play in, a, in like the under 1200 or under a 1400 section where the players are a little bit older and they play a little bit slower. A lot of people play fast when their opponents play fast, which is a really bad mistake. Chess isn't a race. If you get 90 minutes for your game, it's your moves against your time. Your opponent's time is independent. If they want to play too fast, just t say, think to yourself, thanks for the handicap, and let your opponent play fast, but don't try to keep up with them. You should pace yourself according to your clock and not according to how fast your opponent's playing. A lot of people make that mistake. They think it's their time against their opponent's time. They think, oh, I'm half an hour behind him on time. I'm in big trouble. Well, that's true if you're playing too slow, but what if you're not playing too slow? What if you're playing reasonable and he's playing way, way, way too fast? then you might end up a half an hour behind the other person on time, but that's that's not a bad thing. You know, as long as you have enough time to make all your moves reasonably, they're just playing too fast and giving you a handicap. All right, so let's go down this list here that I have in the Novice Nook. Register by mail ahead of time if possible. Advanced registration is where you send in your information by email or by text or by, you know, in the old days we use snail mail and you register for the tournament ahead of time, that saves a lot of time for the tournament director at the tournament because if everybody waits till the registration, which is usually like an hour before the first round, the tournament director has this long line of people that he has to process and it, it, it makes everything harder that morning of the tournament. So it's better to register ahead of time. If you register ahead of time and then you get sick, you can always call the tournament director at the tournament site the day of the, mo of the tournament and say, I'm sorry, I'm ill. Can you withdraw me and give me a refund? And they will do that. So there's very little downside to registering ahead of time. Okay, next comment that's on the Novice Nook is if you're going to join the U.S. Chess Federation, you might want to join the U.S. CF before reg you either during registration or even better online first, and then tell the tournament director what your U.S. CF uh, ID is. So you can go to USCF or sorry USChess.org and click on uh, join, join the US Chess Federation if it's required. I suggest you get the magazine. It costs a few dollars more per year, but it's well, well worth it if you wanna read the magazine online. Most people don't do that. It costs them more money to print the magazine, so they charge you less to join if you wanna read it online. Uh, I suggest you get the hard copy and pay the extra money, but if, my, if cost is, a, is, is an issue for you and you're trying to save a few dollars, well, you could get the online membership. Okay, next comment is make sure all your registration information is printed clearly, completely incorrect. Okay, a lot of times people fill out their registration information and they mess up and they forget to clearly print their ID or, they, their, their regi or their, uh, USCF regi uh, membership is expired and they forget to renew it. Um, you know, or they, if you play in a tournament and you have a section, you might also have a a choice of what what days you want to play like if you're playing in the world open they have a they have a four day a five day a four day a three day and a two day schedule you have to tell the tournament director which schedule you want to play that's not usually an option but you have to tell them what section you're going to be in and so on if you're a scholastic tournament you, you need to tell the tournament director what grade you have or or maybe your school or what uh you know what uh what your age is something like that might be required all right, let's go down. How to select your section. Well, we just talked a little bit about that. If there's multiple sections, 
You might not want to play in the lowest one if you're an adult, you know, just to uh, get people that are playing slower. But you also might want to play up to the next section. Now, sometimes they don't allow you to do that. Most of the time they do. Sometimes there's restrictions on who can play up. Uh, you know, for instance, if there's an under 1800 and there's an under 1400 and your rating is 1380, you have two choices. You can play in the under 1400 where everybody's going to be lower than you and you're going to get pared down every round. But then you have a good chance to win the tournament and you should try to win the tournament. That's fun to do. Or if you're really trying to learn a lot and you say, gee, I'm not going to learn a lot playing 1100s if I'm 1380, then you might decide to play up in the under 1800 section. A lot of people go, oh, I'm 1380. I don't want to play people that are 1780. Well, a lot of the 1780s are playing up also. So if you're a 1380 and you play in the under 1800 section, yes, you might get paired with a 1700 player in the first round. It's possible. And I wouldn't be afraid of them. I mean, I, I learned not to be afraid of them when I was playing. But if you are and you lose to a 1700 in the first round, that's probably the last 1700 you're going to play in the under 1800 section. You're probably going to end up playing a bunch of 14 and 1500s once you lose that first game. So don't worry too much when you, if you play up in the next section that you're going to play people way above you because that's probably not true. And of course, you have to lose your fear of a rating to become a rating. So if you're afraid of people that are way above you, then playing up's not a good idea, but you want to learn to lose that fear because in general, let's say you're playing people 200 points higher than you. If you play them 100 times, you would get 24 points out of 100. That's not 24 wins. That's 24 points. That could be like 15 wins and 18 draws or something. Well, but that's not, you're not losing 98% of your games to people 200 points above you. You're, you're, you're getting 24% of the points. So if you're getting way less than that against people 200 points above you, it's probably because you're afraid of them and you make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, what else do I say here? Get plenty of sleep. Okay, we know that. Know the directions to the tournament. Well, the first day you go to a tournament, if you have to drive there and you're not staying at the hotel, give yourself extra time the first day. If it's a local tournament, you have to drive a couple towns over to make sure you know where it is and how to get there and, you know, use your GPS. That's not as much problem. When I first wrote this, most cars didn't have GPS. <laughs> now they do. People have it on their phones. They're less likely to get caught, but you could get caught in a traffic jam on the way to registration. Another reason to register ahead of time. So you want to uh, make sure that there's no problem because all it takes is that one hold up and all of a sudden you're not registered for the tournament. You missed the first round. It messes up their whole tournament. Okay, bringing equipment. A lot of people go to their first tournament and they think, oh, the tournament's going to supply the equipment. Well, there's some scholastic tournaments like the Nationals where they do buy a million sets and, and they provide them for the kids and then they sell them at the end of the tournament. But that's very, very rare. 99% of the tournaments, you have to bring your equipment. So you want to bring a nice Staunton design board. Don't bring your set. You don't bring your Star Trek set. <laughs> People don't want to play with it. Well, first tournament I went to, somebody brought a non-Staunton set. And the other people he was playing, if they didn't have their own set, they had to, they played with his set and they couldn't even tell what the pieces were. So you want to bring a nice start and set, usually with a king between three and a half and four and a quarter inches high. And you want to bring a nice board that's proportional for that set. If you have a clock, you want to bring the clock. And you want to learn to set your clock to the time limit of the tournament. If the time limit of the tournament is 80 minutes with a 10 second increment, don't wait till you get to the tournament and then start asking the tournament director or, the, or your opponent, gee, this is a new clock. I don't know how to set it. Do you know how to set it? Well, there's a million different clocks. They might not know how to set it. So read the instructions when you're home. Learn how to set your clock. Set it for the time limit of the first round. If it's 80 minutes with a 10-second increment, set it to 80, 10. You'll see 80 minutes on both sides. And set it before you go to the tournament, and then you can turn off the power. And when you turn on the power, it's probably preset. To the, to the level you are. And there's also, most of the, the clocks these days have presets at the back, and you don't even have to set it. You just have to find, oh, 8010 is preset number 23. Or you can do custom presets. You set it to 8010, you say custom preset number one. And then in the future, whenever you play in a tournament that's 8010, you go to custom preset number one, and boom, up it, you only had to set it once, and now you just pop it up. And you've got that 8010 already set. So know how to set your, bring a clock, know how to set it. Usually tournaments provide score sheets, but I suggest you buy a score book to keep all your score sheets together. Buy a score book, bring it to the tournament, bring lots of pencils because pencils break or bring lots of pens because pens, pens run out of ink. 
you know, so that if you keep score and your pen runs out, you just grab another one, you, you, you keep score. The, rec the, the rule for, the, for tournaments, for USCF tournaments is if you know how to keep score, then you must record the game until one side or the other has less than five minutes left. So you have to record your game if you know how. If you mess up your score sheet, you can't stop keeping score. You're still required to keep score. If you mess up, if you miss a move, you can't just stop and tell the tournament director why well, I missed a move. If, if you miss a move and then all of a sudden you play bishop g5 and you realize you missed a move, you don't know what it is, just put a bunch of black, couple blanks on there to indicate that there was two moves missed. And then write down bishop g5 because writing bishop g5 for, for moving your bishop to that square doesn't require you to know what the previous moves were. So you can still continue to record the game and that's exactly what you have to do. So, you know, if you don't know how to record a game in algebraic notation, if you're used to playing online where the computer records the game for you, you might, when you're playing those practice games before the, before the um, tournament, you might want to record the game so that you can do that. All right, and that's exactly what the next suggestion is. Learn algebraic notation. So a lot of people know algebraic t notation to read because they read it online, but then all of a sudden if they have to write it down, then that's a whole new thing for them. They're all of a sudden they're like, uh oh, where's the A file? Where's the where's the F file? Where's the third rank? You know, some boards have A, B, C, one, two, three on them to help beginners figure out. Others don't. I suggest that when you're learning, you don't use the A, B, C, one, two, three. So you'll learn how to count those letters and numbers yourself. If you always re depend on them and you look for a board where it says, oh, this is F4, and you always look for the letters and the numbers, you won't learn to do that yourself. And then when you do play on a board, let's say your opponent supplies a board and at the tournament that doesn't have that on there, and all of a sudden you're lost because you're used to looking for the letters and the numbers, and it's sort of like a crutch. It's like learning how to swim next to the side of the pool, and every time you take a couple strokes, you hold the side of the pool so that you stay up on the water. Well, that's if you don't know how to swim and you think you're going to drown, I guess that might be a good idea, but you're not going to learn how to swim very well if you're holding on to the side of the pool every time you take a stroke or two. Okay, next thing is make sure the dates, times of the registration, and the times of the rounds. All right, so I made a mistake like this in my first tournament. I assumed the rounds started the same time every day. Well, what they did was the final day, they made the rounds one hour earlier so that everybody could go home earlier and they could finish the tournament without going late into Sunday night. Well, I, all the other rounds, Friday and Saturday, had started at 11 o'clock, so I assumed Sunday would start at 11 o'clock, but it started at 10 I got there at like three minutes before uh, 11 and everybody had been playing and I was paired with a guy and I saw the game and my flag was about to fall for the one hour forfeit but I didn't realize I was at that board and I ran into the other room and saw the pairing and I ran back and by the time I did that the three minutes were up and my flag fell and I had used an hour and it was 11 o'clock and my opponent claimed to forfeit and I, I said to my opponent who happened to be a blind person I said I'm sorry I'm late I thought the round was at 10 I will give you the forfeit, but would you like to play a game anyway, maybe at a shorter time limit, and we could still finish on time, just to give you a chance to play, uh, you know, but you can claim the forfeit in the game. And my opponent said to me, sorry, I don't want to play. And, you know, I didn't ask him why, but ironically, that was the, the, the my first tournament, and I had been pa I was paired with a blind player, and I never got paired with a blind player again in the rest of my life. So I... I ne ended up my whole career, I would never played against a blind player in a tournament, but I would have, except that I showed up an hour late and I forfeited. So make sure you know the dates and times of the registration and the times of each of the rounds. Okay, find your first round pairing. When the pairing, the pairing sheet goes up on the wall, there's going to be, for each section has their own pairing sheet, and on the far left of the pairing sheet are the board numbers. Every board has a number, like board number 27, board number 122. So your board number will be on the far left. Your name will be one of either on the left if you're white or on the right if you're black. So find your name. If you are left, you can look at your opponent's name and you might want to jot it down on your score sheet when you get to see the pairing. So for instance, suppose you're on board 122 and you're white and black is Eddie Jones. So you write Eddie Jones on your score sheet. You go to board 122 if the guy's already sitting there, you say, hi, I'm Dan, you know, is, are you Eddie? And he says, yes, and you shake his hands. If he's not there, you can, you know, you can set up the board. If you're, if you're white, normally black gets his choice of color and clock. 
even if you get there first, white does not get his choice. Black still has the choice even if black gets there second. But in any case, you can sit down and when your opponent shows up, you can say, Hi, I'm Dan, are you Eddie? Why are you asking your opponent if he's Eddie? Well, believe it or not, people make mistakes. They go to the wrong board. And I actually had one of my students who was an experienced student. He went to a tournament and he sat down at the board and his opponent was there and he assumed that was the right opponent. They didn't ask each other's names. They started playing the game, and then I noticed that on the next board, the, the guy was waiting for his opponent to show up, and his opponent wasn't there. And I looked on the score sheets, and I realized that my student was playing the wrong person, that they, his opponent had sat down at the wrong board. His opponent meant to be playing the guy on the next board, but he saw the numbers in between the boards, and he thought it was the numbers were on the left when actually the numbers were on the right, which is an easy mistake to make. So I went back to the tournament director, and I said, uh, there's a game in there where two people are playing, but they're not the people that are paired against each other. And the tournament director came out. He checked the two. He stopped the game. He said, uh, you're at the wrong board. He told the other guy to go to the other board, and he fixed it. So be very careful. Make sure you're playing the right person. Uh, those things can go wrong. It's very easy in your first tournament to get all nervous and mess those things up. I guess we should talk about nervousness for a second. There's two types of nervousness in chess. There's the nervousness of something new, and there's the nervousness of competition. You're always going to have the nervousness of competition. But when you go to your first tournament, you're going to have the nervousness of something new. You're not going to know what the etiquettes are. You're not going to know how to report the results. You're not going to know when they call the tournament director. You know, all those kind of things. So you're going to be nervous. Well, okay, that's normal. And it'll go away if, if you play in a bunch of tournaments in a row. Let's say you play five tournaments in six months. By the fifth tournament, you won't be as nervous about going to a tournament. You'll still be nervous about competing, but you won't be nervous about all the newness. You'll sort of get used to things. You'll be used to recording the game. You'll be used to, you know, all those kind of things. Speaking of uh, calling the tournament director, this is one of the most important things I should mention in the video, and one of the most important things, obviously, to know in, in any tournament, and that is never argue with your opponent, never listen to your opponent's advice, never listen to your opponent's rules, if your opponent says something and he says you can't do that or, or something strange happens in your game, don't argue with your opponent. Don't try to figure it out. Don't make your own rules. Just stop the game. Stop the clock. Get the tournament director. Bring him over to your board. Tell him what happened and let him make a ruling. So I've seen many, 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 many. I could fill up five videos probably with people who got into trouble because they listened to their opponent, and their opponent said, you know, A, B, C, and they said, okay, and then they did something, and then after the game, they found out that A, B, C was completely wrong. So don't do that. You know, maybe your opponent's telling you the right thing, but they're, it's not their call. It's the call of the tournament director. So, for instance, if somebody makes an illegal move, don't try to just fix it or say, well, okay, I'll do this, or... No, get the if there's an illegal move, you stop the game, you get the tournament director, and let him make the ruling. There's just so many things that could happen that way. Um, you know, <laughs> draw offers, and uh, oh, just, uh, as I said, I have, I have story after story after story. Anybody who's been a tournament director for a long time has lots of stories of all kinds of crazy things that happen in tournaments, but most of the crazy things happen when they don't get the tournament director. So that's the number one thing you need to know when you're going to your tournament is if anything strange happens in your game, if there's any seems to be any kind of rule violation, anything happens at all, don't try to fix it yourself. Don't listen to how your opponent wants to fix it. Just get the tournament director. Okay? And by the way, when you get the tournament director, unless you're playing like in a national scholastic tournament where they specifically say, if you need the tournament director, raise your hand. Don't do that. Stop the clock. Walk over to where the tournament directors are and get one. Don't raise your hand. Raising your hand is for like little kids tournaments. You know that that's not standard for a regular USCF tournament. Okay, uh, we talked about finding your first round pairing. Double check your information when you first show up. Let's say you're pre-registered. The tournament director will have a list on the wall of pre-registration information. Make sure you're there, which means you're pre-registered. If you are, you don't need to go up to the tournament director. Make sure all your information is correct. If it is, don't go up to the tournament director. If something's wrong, like he put you in the wrong section, 
then yes, can get, get in the registration line and say, hi, I'm pre-registered, but I'm, you have me in the under 1600 section, I should be in under 1400. Bring a small snack. Yes, for long games, if you've never been to a long tournament and played long games, you can get hungry. You can bring a small snack to eat during there. The tournaments usually supply water, but don't bring a snack that makes the, don't bring chips that make a lot of noise. You wanna bring something like a little pasta or something that can you can eat quietly while you're go doing. Etiquette, there's a lot of etiquette things. Uh, you don't have to say check. Um, if you need to adjust the piece, you want to say, I adjust before you touch the piece, or je double, which is the French word for I adjust. If you want to resign, the two ways to resign are to either say to someone, I resign, or to grab your king and purposely place it down nicely. If you reach out and accidentally knock over your king, that's not resigning the game, and so on. So there's certain uh, uh, etiquette things. Um, both players have to report the results. After the game, win or lose or draw, you go up to the sheet where it paired you, and you put a one next to your name if you won, a zero next to your name if you lost, a half if you drew. Both players are responsible for doing that. Don't, if you lose, don't expect the winner just to do it. If he forgets to do it, then, and nobody reports your results, you can end up with a, at least a temporary double forfeit for not reporting the results. So both players must report the results. Next, next suggestion is if you lose, don't panic. The answer is it's in the past. You'll learn from your losses. You recorded the game. Don't go to the next game and start playing fast or crazy or upset. Forget it. You're going you're gonna to lose half your games at least in Swiss tournaments. That's the way it goes, especially in your first tournament where you're not as experienced. Don't go home. <laughs> Just relax, take a deep breath, get to the next round. All right, if you have to leave, let's say you get sick or something, just go up to the tournament director and say, I can't make the rest of the tournament. I got to go home. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll be back next tournament or whatever. But just tell the tournament director if you have to go home. And uh, as I said, you can also take a bye if you need to miss one of the rounds. Just make sure you tell the tournament director enough ahead of time. All right, we've covered a lot of ground in today's video enhancing your first tournament experience. Hopefully, if you've been to tournaments before, especially if you've only been to one or two or three or four, I probably said a few things in the video that helped you too. All right, again, you could uh, subscribe to the channel, you can like the video, but the best thing you can do is send an email to all your chess friends or a text and say, hey, check out on YouTube, Dan Heisman Chess. It's a great channel and I appreciate getting those new people in there. And you can also check out my chess tip of the day on Twitter. I just I, I got best Twitter feed from the uh, Chess Journalists of America this year for my Chess Tip of the Day. I've been doing Chess Tip of the Day on Twitter at Dan Heisman for the last 12 years. See you next time. Bye.